Christina Dornbush, and we will be presenting on the topic of centrifugal molding of elastomeric robots. I mean, my name is Billy Judd. My name is Nikhil Joe. My name is Benjamin Ho Young Lee. Now, just to give you an overview of what we'll be going through this morning, first we're going to just explain what are elastomeric robots. We'll be going through the design process and the fabrication, then we'll move into the results of our, our experiment and the significance of that right now and moving forward into the future. <laughs> So the field of robotics has been growing for the past few decades, and the field of elastomeric robots specifically has been growing in the past, past, few, past few years. And <laughs> traditional hard robots uh, have some limitations. They're made of mostly metals and plastics that have a lot of electrical components, which makes them heavy and expensive. Also, they are good in predictable, controlled environments, such as factories, but are not good in uncontrolled environments. Elastomeric robots, however, provide some um, solutions to those problems. They are made of only silicon, which makes it very light and also very cheap. Also, they are small and flexible, so they can conform to uneven surfaces. Um, elastomeric robots are actuated pneumatically or by air, so air is pumped into the robot and causes it to bend. Also, they are fabricated from two different types of polymers, and they each constitute a separate layer in the robot. Most work so far has been done on dry areas, such as the four-legged creature you can see on this picture right here, and also little robotic grippers. So, so far the Japanese scientists have, were the first to really work with elastomeric robots, but it was not until Harvard's Whitesides group that popularized soft robots in the United States. The field of aquatic elastomeric robots is not, not explored very much. And in this picture you can see a manta ray that was developed by the Japanese, and that's one of the very few um, aquatic elastomeric robots. And our design was modeled after a jellyfish with expanding and contracting motions. So as mentioned before, our design was mainly focused on jellyfish. Before we could start the fabrication process, we had to start molding and making our products in, within the, uh, the virtual SOLIDWORKS program. And in this program, we, we could take these molds, 116 by 16 millimeter cubes, and we would cut into them, as you can see, to find to draw our little jellyfish. Some main things about this components are the top molding, which holds the material, and the bottom mold, which will actually fill up and will bake to create our mold. And once we're done with our design process, we send it to the 3D printer, and there we wait one to two days until we actually get the 3D printed mold, which you can start the fabrication process. So we had three generations of jellyfish. Our first generation had six legs, and, but it was a little bit smaller because we had to fit the constraints of the centrifuge. We had no standards for channel sizings, and we had to come up with new standards and different uh, sizings and really experiment in this first design. So the second generation, we decided to make an overall larger jellyfish. We got rid of the top uh, overflow chamber and instead made it a lot smaller, as you can see by the top molding. And we increased the surface area and played around with the channel sizes so that we could experiment different, um, different motions. However, another addition to this was a central chamber, which would deal with the uh, buoyancy problems that we were facing in the first, the first generation. However, we were unable to fabricate this. And this was our final design, the third generation. And as you can tell, it was also a bigger jellyfish. However, this time, instead of having six legs, we had five legs. The five legs let us have larger surface area. We also played around with the channels once again, moving them closer to the center so that the bending motion will be greater than the first and second generation. Now, the fabrication process for elastomeric robots is completely different from that of hard robots. Unlike conventional hard robots, elastomeric robots are do not have tiny assembled pieces. Rather, they're composed of just two silicone polymers. The base layer is made of Ecoflex, which is a very stretchable elastic. It stretches to nine times its original size and has a very high tensile strength, which means it's very resistant to pulling. The PDMS layer has a much, much higher tensile strength, but the other half is, it doesn't stretch as much. It only stretches to 1.2 times its original size, but provides structure to the robot, and it allows it to inflate only in one direction, rather than inflate in all directions like a balloon. For comparison, we put up the tensile strength of a balloon and a tire, and you can see how much more resistant these are to stretching and pulling. So our method of fabrication was created by Harvard's Whitesides group, which is called centrifugal molding. 
So essentially, we take our top and bottom molds, fill it with EcoFlex, and place it on a centrifuge, and spin it at 800 RPM. Now, we do this in order to gain control of our mold. This allows us to control the thickness and curvature of every dimension of this limb. And this also removes any air bubbles, which may remain inside the liquid structure. Now, air bubbles deteriorate the integrity of the elastomeric structure by making the layers very thin. So when these thin layers are inflated, they rip. So by using centripetal force, all the dense ecoflex is pushed to the outside, while the air bubbles are pulled to the inside and out the overflow chamber. Now this greatly reduces production time over conventional open face methods because it, moved, it combines the heating and uh, air removal process into one. This moves the process from single prototyping to a medium scale level, which allows elastomeric robots to be more feasible. The next step in this process is adhesion, where we take the two layers, PDMS and Ecoflex, and put them together. Using this method from Harvard's Whitesides group, we first create a base layer of PDMS and allow that to partially harden. After that, we pour some more liquid PDMS on top to act as the glue. Then we place the Ecoflex on top and we heat it. This creates a flexible seal and it doesn't allow any air to escape. This is also very fast, so we can make more robots in a shorter amount of time. The one disadvantage of this is that the liquid PDMS has the potential to fill up all the channels inside the base layer, thereby preventing any inflation and the robot's essentially worthless. Now the final step is actuation, where we actually get the robot to move. Through repeated inflation and deflation, we harness the force of friction to cause motion. Our goal is to reach 100% elongation without any rips or tears. The two methods that we've explored are pneumatic and hydraulic actuation. In pneumatic, we pump in air, and the benefit of this is that it's very quick to inflate and deflate due to air's low viscosity. However, the one disadvantage of this is that air has a lower density than water. And since we are in the water, our robot needs to be able to stay at below the surface of the water. By pumping in air, we actually cause the robot to float. Now, we've experimented with hydraulic actuation, where we pump in water. Since we're keeping the overall density of the robot neutral, the same, this should help create a neutral buoyancy. However, we could not accomplish this because our robot did not have a return force, which allowed the water to come out and deactuate. Now here you can see pictures of actuation. First, that's the robot before anything is pumped in. And then when air is pumped in, they bend towards the hard PDMS layer. This, is, uh, this happens because PDMS has a much higher tensile resistance so that it doesn't stretch as much and causes the entire robot to bend around it. Now we're just going to go over our results. First of all, as we've already said, we designed three generations of an Adarian-based robot. And the first two of these generations were successful. We went through into the fabrication stage. One of them, unfortunately, we remained at the design stage, but all three of them were um, conceptualized and designed. Now, for, to remind you of the basic design of each of them, the first generation was small, it was six-legged, it had webbing between the legs, and that webbing was carried through all three generations. The second generation was elar um, elongated in the legs, and it had a central chamber to try to neutralize the buoyancy. And the third generation had elongated legs once again, and it had five legs instead of six. Now the first generation successes and failures. Success, um, but basically that the webbing allowed full actuation because our initial ideas included either having no webbing, which would not have provided enough force on the water for motion, or having an entire circle, of a thick robot, which would not have allowed enough bending to to fully actuate and provide that force on the water. So with the webbing, we were able to fully actuate. Also, by moving through the water, we gained a simple victory there that we could simply move through the water with this uh, swimming robot. Failures, we had an issue with buoyancy, as Mikhail had stated. Uh, when you, buoyancy is mainly dependent on the volume of an object in the water. So when you're increasing the volume and the mass is remaining the same, that's going to increase the buoyancy. So it will tend to float up to the top of the water. So it was hard to get counterweights that could effectively deal with this uh, fluctuating buoyancy. 
Now, there was also little horizontal motion, which meant that the majority of our uh, movement was based on the buoyancy fluctuations as opposed to the design itself, which was a failure. Now, we have a video here to demonstrate the motion of this robot as it moves, and it moves relatively slowly, but it does move. And at the end here, you can see the buoyancy and as it was overactuated. Now, moving into the second generation, successes and failures. Successes is that this equalizes buoyancy. If we have the central chamber and the legs, we can alternate from the central chamber and the legs in where we're pumping in air. So that maintains the volume and would give an equal buoyancy throughout so we could do counterweights that would outweigh the, um, the mass of the buoyancy of this robot, excuse me. And it's also a viable option for future research. So looking into the future, this may become something that is popularized. However, we were unable to progress beyond design because there are size restrictions in a lab. So in order to make the central chamber large enough to outweigh the volume of the legs, we would not have been able to make large enough legs to function. Now, the third generation successes and failures, uh, we had a greater force exerted on the water because of the elongated legs. As we said, it's, we eliminated the overflow cavity. So we were able to make a larger robot and we had more contraction because we moved the channels in towards the center of the robot. So a greater proportion of the robot was um, contracting and therefore exerting a greater force. However, the failure is that because we had to eliminate the central chamber, we continued with issues with the buoyancy. So the significance of the swimming robot is that it's one of the first soft robots to be in an aquatic environment. So it expanded the field of soft robots and we hope that it has opened a window of many opportunities for other researchers, researchers to explore. So some future work includes improving the swimming of the robot. Right now, the swimming motion relies a lot on changes in buoyancy and it's really slow. But with further development, it could be smoother and faster. Also, as stated previously, there are problems with buoyancy. As you pump more air into the robot, it gets less dense, so it floats up. The second design, or the second generation, was designed to, to combat the buoyancy issues, but it was only designed and did not go into the fabrication process. But for the development and fa actually fabricating it, we could ma make a robot that maintains buoyancy. Also, currently the robots are tethered by a tube that pumps the air into the robot. This, however, restricts some of the mo motion and the movement of the robots. But by developing onboard actuators, we can increase the freedom and mobility of the robots. Some potential applications include marine studies, rescue missions, and reconnaissance. The robots are, can, with further development, they could blend in with um, other aquatic creatures and provide marine scientists with um, observations of undisturbed areas. Also, they are small and then they can fit within small spaces, so they could be a potential candidate for rescue missions. Also, they are made purely of silicon, so they can go nearly undetected by radar and sonar sensors, making them good for reconnaissance. So we'd like to thank all the people that made this project possible. First, our professor, Dr. Aaron Mazio, assistants, uh, research assistants, Park Kulkarni and Sinan Bay, our RTA, Tara Nealon, director, Dr. Eileen Rosen, assistant director, Jean-Patrick Antoine, Rutgers University and its mechanical and aerospace engineering facility, and all the sponsors of GSET that made this program possible. Are there any questions? Yeah? Uh, any special reason for you to change the six light to five lights uh, from the second generation to the third generation? Um, <clears throat> the main reason why we did that was because Having six legs compared, uh, having five legs compared to six legs allows us to have a greater area in which we make our legs. Essentially, we made our legs a lot larger since we could have less legs that are surrounding the center circle. Our goal in this was that we pump in as little air as possible, but achieve maximum bending so that we don't uh, face the same buoyancy issues as before. So, from uh, that's the point you mentioned. Uh, I guess that would require testing. We've only tested uh, six and five right now. We're still trying to find the magic number that would provide the optimal propulsion. Thank you. Uh, you indicated that the buoyancy was the main problem with your robot floating up to the surface. 
uh, did you ever investigate the uh, option of uh, counterweighting it, like uh, building a counterweight inside the elastomer? Um, yeah, that would be definitely an option. What we tended to use was just to attach it with tubes because that, for our um, purposes, was easy enough to do and it worked. Um, for workout outside of the lab, that would definitely be a viable option. But for our intents and purposes, the, um, the hanging weights worked for us. Any other questions? Please. Thank you. Thank you.